Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if we could have the first slide, please. Ah, the, uh, I would be delighted to um, introduce my great friend, Christina Lindholm. I've known Christina for maybe more than 25 years, and I was so pleased when the um, organizers asked me to introduce Christina. Christina has many friends amongst the audience here this afternoon, and everybody is wishing her well, and um, I'm so delighted to bestow this honor on Christina. So for those of you who may not be quite so familiar with Christina, um, Christina's had a, a very, um, a very well um, respected history in, um, in wound healing. And in terms of the scientific aspects of Christina's work, she is a famous international lecturer. We have got people from all across the world here today who will have um, had the benefit of listening to Christina present on her research. Her main scientific uh, areas of interest are pressure ulcers and wound microbiology. But Christina's published more than 70 scientific papers and um, 10 scientific reports on wound management. She's received several scientific awards, which, uh, like Christina, has, she has kept um, and been very modest about. And she's published a Scandinavian textbook on wounds and has also written several chapters in national and international books. Her PhD in 1993 was comprised of five studies on leg ulcer epidemiology, treatment, health economics, and quality of life. And I'm very pleased and privileged amongst my prized possessions is to have a signed copy of that dissertation. And I thank Christina for giving me that all those years ago. Um, her later research has focused on wound infections, infection control, and pressure ulcers as well. Now, Christina's history in terms of organizational engagement is that she's been leading and influencing at an international level for many years. And she's really been at the center of a broad range of international ventures. She's the editor-in-chief of the Swedish Wound Journal, SAR. Um, she's been a council member and first president of the Swedish Association of Tissue Viability Nursing. She was one of the founder members of the European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, EPUAP, and she was a UMA Council member from 1994 until 2008, and she hosted the UMA Conference in Stockholm in the year 2000. And um, in 2014 now, Christina is hosting another wound conference in Stockholm, which will be the 17th annual meeting of EPUAP um, in late in the summer this year. So, um, in terms of this honorary lecture, um, lecturers are uh, proposed and discussed and agreed on because of their huge contribution to the specialty of wounds. And Christina has earned this distinction due to her commitment, um, her committed life work within wound healing. Any of you who will know Christina know she's got enormous energy, energy and she's really pushed the boundaries of research and practice and trailblazed her way towards improving clinical practice for the benefit of patients uh, in Sweden and beyond. And those of you who know Christina know that the patients are right at the heart of everything that she does. Um, Christina's co-authored a groundbreaking research paper that changed the perception of how painful leg ulcers are for patients. And this really changed the way that we all thought about, uh, about the management and care of people with, with leg ulcers. But through this work, Christina stressed the importance of clinical staff understanding the patient's experience and thereby bringing um, to the forefront the significance of adopting a human approach to wound care. So I welcome, warmly welcome, my colleague and friend, Christina Lindholm. so much uh, Sue. Um, I, I'm overwhelmed. I do not know how you know all these things about me and half of my lecture is then already done so you can fall asleep a little bit in the darkness. I'm extremely glad and happy of course for this honorary, uh, this opportunity to have, to have an honorary lecture. It will be quite a different uh, lecture I tell you. Um, Hola a todos, to the Spanish 
group here, and the Portuguese, I think, is about the same, isn't it? My warmest thanks to you, Ma. Many of you in this audience would have been more worthy than me to have this honorary. You are just not old enough. <laughs> Your time will come. I will, sh I will make a short look in the back mirror, and some of it has already be been said by Sue. I didn't know that you were going to do all this into these details. The first Yuma conference in 2000 in Stockholm was hosted by Henrik Nielsen and myself, I can say. Henrik Nielsen is now the big boss of the whole organization committee of this uh, Yuma conference, and it has grown dramatically. But this was the first Yuma conference that we arranged. And uh, immediately after that, I went into heart intensive care because of the efforts. It was really hard work. <laughs> Nowadays, it's, it's uh, much better, I tell you. Everything is well organized by people who can organize. Um, we all remember the first patient we saw with a leg ulcer or a pressure ulcer, don't we? And um, I was so inspired by this guy. I was a young nurse student at that time at the surgical ward, and one of our patients who had a terrible leg ulcer he was going for a completely new method, He's going to the theater. He should be injected with a green color in order to see what was well vascularized and what was not of his ulcer. So the surgeon should uh, scrape off all the dead tissue, the necrotic tissue, and then the patient should heal, uh, of course. But it was a very dramatic injection, I tell you, because the guy became green immediately, completely green. And his two hair pieces were red. So you can just imagine the sensational look of this guy. And I was the young nurse student who should bring him back to the ward with this absolutely green Martian person, more or less. Unbelievable. And at that time, the doors opened at the hospital and all the visitors, all the family came in to see all their, their family members. That was a horror experience. After that, I think everything is possible. Uh, anyhow, I will bend. Oh, anyhow, um, he healed, but he also was in the middle of everyone's attention. People were queuing to see this green, green guy. I was a registered nurse in 1965, and 28 uh, years later, I found out maybe I should make a PhD. That was not for the sake of the PhD. That was because I was so interested to see what leg ulcer patients really, what kind of a life they had. This was their, my record, my personal record. This guy had had his leg ulcers for 72 years, never seeked uh, uh, health care, never seen a doctor for it, uh, working, never been away from work a single day. And I was so impressed and really interested. This poor guy had 12 years of suffering, sitting in his wheelchair, taken care of by his wife and the community nurses. He did not have a diagnosis. He was sent soon, very, very late after 12 years, he was sent to Solgren's Hospital in Gothenburg. He got a diagnosis, ulcerative colitis. He was uh, treated for that, and eight weeks later he was full, nutritionally uh, perfect, in a perfect shape. His, his wounds were completely healed and he were, was out of the wheelchair. So, I mean, these kind of patients really influence your, your interest, don't they? As Sue has already uh, talked about my research, so we can go quite quickly through that. Um, maybe the quality of life study was the, in, the only one that I will mention here, or, yeah, really. This picture <laughs> brought me around the world, I must say. I was completely surprised, because in all textbooks at this time, it was said that patients with venous leg ulcers do not have any pain. The only instrument I could find at that time which was validated and tested for reliability was the Nottingham Health Profile. Then you compare every patient that you want to look at with a, a person who is of the same age and the same sex and who does not have, in this case, a leg ulcer. So um, if we put the bar on 100, you can see everything that is above 100 was quality of life reduction in the different areas. And as you can see, the pain was the most protruding one. 
that made us rethink this about pain. Uh, Tanya Phillips later did the same thing and had exactly the same results. And also that the men were more affected by venous leg ulcers than the women were. This was 125 patients, but it, it made a little bit um, of a difference, I think. Another study that was uh, published after my, my uh, PhD, as a matter of fact, was uh, this when we detected in our little group the MMPs, because I was convinced there is something in the chronic wounds that is not in the acute wounds that make them chronic non-healing. And I collected uh, uh, exudation from, I don't remember, many, many, many patients went around to their homes and so on and lifted their ba bandages and took out the swabs and, and we had a garlic, uh, you see this pressure thing, <laughs> to, to collect uh, um, uh, the wound secretion and then it was analyzed in Convatex laboratory in Chester where they had just got this equipment to see. So we discovered the MMPs, which is now a very hot uh, subject. Then, of course, research continued and continued, looked at wound infections after a thoracic surgery with one of my PhD students. Ichthyosis was another uh, thesis, pressure ulcers, epidemiology, classification, etc. Microbiology, MRSA patients' experiences, among other things. Helene is so dark you can't see her, but she's here. Hospital hygiene and nutrition. And uh, now I'm doing a little bit the dessert of my research life. I'm looking at ethnobiology, ethnobotany, and healing and microbiology, which is extremely exciting. I will look further back, a little bit, or quite a lot further back. Trauma and violence has been around since human was there. The, the cave painting you see to the left is 25 years old. The wounded man in Hans von Gernsdorf, a uh, breathtakingly fantastic book from 1500 something, uh, you can see in the next slide. And the last slide is a picture from now and here from our, our big hospital in Stockholm. But if we look ba back around 11,000 years, agriculture was introduced. Healing herbs had spiritual, or were thought to have spiritual power. And those who collected these herbs and knew how to use them, they became spiritual leaders in their respective villages. And collection of, of healing herbs is regarded to be the world, world's oldest profession. Some, th some people say it's the midwives. I do not know, really. <laughs> we can uh, discuss that. And, uh, People were meeting over the borders, over cultures, over countries, over continents, and one of the things they brought to each other were the healing herbs. Plants were regarded to be mediators between humans and their creator. The first wound healer is said to be the Emperor Fuxi. 2,900 before Christ, he introduced morphine, and he was a great wound healer. He had many, many recipes for wound uh, dressings. In the old Egypt, dove blood clay was used. And I was so surprised when I went to the EPUAP microclimate conference in Southampton that they are also doing research about clay in these days. That's quite nice. Raw meat, honey, of course. Coming back to that. Cow's dung, that is very strange to understand. Paracelsus also lived around 1500 and was a very famous doctor at that time. He said, Nature has its own nature in every limb. Wherefore, every surgeon should know that it is not he, but nature who heals the wound. Bit frustrating, but still something to think about. I would like to speculate with you a little bit about what future wound healing might be. Is it nature guided by science? Hippocrates, 460 before Christ, he wrote that wounds should be cleansed with wine, and a research group somewhere, I do not uh, find the reference, unfortunately. Uh, they tried E. coli bacteria in a lab environment, and they saw that with red wine, the E. coli died immediately. That's quite interesting. He also said, and the patient should also be given some wine to drink, so that was really holistic view already at that time, wasn't it? 
I'm citing Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel Prize laureate in 1959. He said, in the composition of wine is the secret of life. There are the ferments, the enzymes, the substrates, and the products. There in wine is found the great generalization. All life is fermentation. That was his theory. And he said, the whole universe is included in one glass of wine. We must remember that tonight. I think it's quite beautiful. Uh, Harvard University have done a lot looking at the vascular uh, system and, and the red wine. And uh, they have, and other, many other groups as well, have documented that the agent that is probably most active is resveratrol. It's difficult to say for me, <laughs> resveratrol. Achilles, if we go back again to the old Greek, in the Iliad by Homerus, around 700 before Christ, uh, Achilles was, you see, uh, he was described as the big hero. He was also the wound healer of the Trojan War. Everybody came to, to Achilles because he could heal wounds. And what did he use? He used the yoro, Achillea millefolium, this beautiful little flower that grows wild all over, if you look for it. And uh, millefolium means a thousand leaves, the thousand leaved Achilles plant. That's quite beautiful. The yarrow is well documented. Well, they have found pollen from 60,000 years old in the Neanderthal grape with, um, from, the, uh, from the yarrow. He called it also the soldier's plant, Herba militaris, one of the few all heal plants, a magic plant that can heal all wounds. The Navajo Indians thought it was a panacea, a life medicine and it was uh, regarded that it had strong wound healing properties. Tea was prepared uh, from this uh, plant, from the yarrow plant to treat wounds with. The medical effects that have been very carefully described are antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, vasodilating, wound healing, and hemostatic. Another plant that is still used in some remote areas of Sweden and it was widely used when I started my PhD study, studies. It's a traditional folk medicine, Plantago Meyer, the plantain plant. Also the Indian in the US thought it was, it, they call it the white man's footstep, and they also thought it was the only good thing that the white man brought into their tribes. Shakespeare writes about it in Romeo and Julia, and it uh, contains Alcubine, which is uh, antimicrobial, allantoins, which stimulates cell growth, phenols that stimulate wound healing, it's well documented. And one of my PhD students at the Agricultural University wrote his thesis about this and could also see that there were significant healing effects of this plant. There are, of course, lots of precautions to be raised about raw plant material. The difficulty is to standardize it so you have the same concentration all the time. Um, the growth circumstances, the soil, which should not be soil but artificial soil, the light, everything must be standardized so you know you have an even concentration uh, of the active compounds. There are always risk of allergies, of course, and risk of contaminations. But I think with a modern technique and technology, we can solve this problem quite well. I will say a few words about zoo ethnology, the, the, the animals that we use in wound management, which I think is a fascinating thing. The spider's web, we know that it is effective against E. coli, bacteroides subtilis, for example, and many other bacteria. Uh, they are also used now to build new wound dressing, the matrix in wound uh, dressings. They were used in the Battle of Crecy, 1346. All soldiers had their little boxes with spider web in, in case they should be hurt. Shakespeare writes about spider web in a Midsummer Night's Dream. I shall desire you of more acquaintance, good master cobweb. If I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. I spent some time in the Seychelles over the years, and there the palm spiders are used. They, you, you crash the back part of it, and the secrete is put into the tropical, very infected wounds, and that's the only really effective remedy for these wounds. 
frogs is another of my favorite animals. The frog skin is full of hyaluronic acid, the same thing that is in the, in the fetus, in the skin of the fetus. That's why if you operate intrauterinely, as for example, Goido Ziprandi, our dear friend here, who will lecture on Friday, he, can all, he has also shown this no sign of scar tissue when this uh, baby is born later. Very interesting. It's said that the skin of the frog is, uh, uh, contains maganin, which are peptides, uh, and they have antimicrobial properties. The skin of the frog is a portable pharmacy, is a citation. The frog skin is used on burns in many parts of the world due to the high content of hyaluronic acid. This is more familiar to all of us, I think. The larva therapy, the maggot therapy, which is so effective to debride wounds with. Very well documented in our days, I should say. Leeches have been used since 5,000 years and it was the first live medical device that FDA uh, approved, as a matter of fact. It's used in hand surgery still, some of you might use it still, uh, to take a DMI away to save the function of the very tiny nerves in the hands, for example. Sheepskin is something, is another thing, which is quite fascinating. You know, in, in, when I was a young uh, nurse student, we had two options for those who had pressure ulcers or who were at risk of getting it. We had linen sheet and we had sheepskin at that time. Then came all the synthetic, synthetic sheepskin, which was more hygienic but showed to be not very good to prevent pressure ulcers with, you, you know, when you had to wash them and so that was not a good thing. Uh, sheepskin is widely used in Australia, New Zealand, all over. And if you look at the fiber of one single hair of a sheep, it's an amazing construction, amazing construction for the microclimate of the wound. But of course, we still have some hygienic uh, opposition against it, but now you can wash this sheepskin, so it's, it's another thing. What about wound cleansing and debridement? Biofilm has uh, got a new role when we look at cleansing and debriding wounds. We did a study some years ago in 345 patients. We took bacterial swabs before and after cleansing with tap water. And we could see that we could only reduce uh, the number, the quantity of the bacteria with 19% with this procedure and unchanged 65% and increased in 16%. That's quite unexpected. What uh, the species we could reduce were Staph aureus, Streptococcus group B, and Proteus. Significant reduction, but the rest we couldn't do much to. In Peru, in around 1700, um, they had wound lickers. And I have always thought, how could they employ these people to do this unpleasant thing? But now I understand, of course, there was biofilm already in Peru in that time. And it, it is polysaccharides. It's sweet, of course. They got their sweet by licking the wounds. And the tongue, you see, is quite a good debrider. And then it is saliva that is rinsing the wound and all the growth factors in the saliva. So it wasn't a bad idea, and the theory, I mean, is quite attractive, but practice, of course. We can find other things. In ancient Greece, in the Gospel of Luke, for example, later, uh, there, this picture by Nicolo Rosselli showing St. Lazaro is uh, showing how dogs were licking wounds. And I think many of you in this room have had patients who have said, my dog is licking my wound, and it becomes much better. Have you? heard about, seen that, have that kind of patience. Yeah, I think you have, many of you. As a matter of fact, a dog's tongue is a doctor's tongue. <laughs> it is a lot of peroxide, which attacks cell walls or bacteria and damage them. Cystatin, antibody IgA, thrombospondin, antiviral, which are antiviral. There are proteases in the saliva of a dog. 
and the protease e inhibitor in the saliva. There are also numerous growth factors in the saliva of dogs, and it's said also to be in humans. And it all, it's also an analgesic, an opiophine that is taking the pain away, which is quite interesting. Will a future debrider be, for example, a debris soft, which is very near to the tongue, uh, impregnated with beneficial components of saliva? That is something to think about, Lohmann and Rauscher and other companies. <laughs> Precaution, of course, uh, when, we, when we look at the dogs licking the wounds, there is quite a risk for bacteria and virus that they can be transmitted. Honey from, beans, from bees have been used 4,000 years before we detected bacteria. It inhibits uh, growth of more than 60 bacterial species. And one person who has done more research about honey than anyone else, I think is Rose Cooper. She has done some marvelous e experiments to explain the uh, effects of honey in wounds. Uh, we know that it takes MRSA and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It debrides wounds. It's a high osmolarity, reduction of wound edema because it's so sweet. Slow release of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen peroxide is also attributed uh, to honey. And it is effective against malodor. There is an excellent uh, paper from Denmark uh, about this in uh, malignant, malignant wounds. Some unknown mechanisms are also reported. There is something which we do not understand in honey. Sometimes it works beautifully, and in some cases it isn't so much of an effect. We know from, uh, from all cultures in, uh, in the world that the wild honey was the one that was most attractive. People were risking their lives to get the wild honey, the fresh honey, this guy is climbing 60 meters up on a wall in this very dangerous, very, very little equipment, this very dangerous uh, mission that he was to, to uh, get the wild honey. I am um, very privileged to be mentor to these two young researchers from Sweden, Lund University, Tobias Olofsson and Alessandra Vasquez. Some years ago, they did a marvelous dis discovery and it might be the unknown mechanism that can, be, can explain this thing. They found in the honey stomach of the honey bee, um, they found 13 symbiont lactic acid bacteria that work together to protect the bee and the honey from all these pathogenic bacteria that the, the bees bring into the hive when they come out, have been collecting nectar on all flowers. They come home and they have to sterilize this nectar and they do it in the honey womb, which is quite interesting. They dissected numerous honey wombs and they could uh, discover these certain. These uh, pictures to the, to the right are taken by Lennart Nilsson, the famous Swedish uh, medical photographer. He went in, he could come in inside the uh, honey womb of the honey bee, which is quite fascinating and take these pictures. He has also taken pictures on, uh, on the biofilm of this beneficial bacteria. A lot of attention, of course, has been given to this group. And um, we had a big, big uh, paper in the biggest uh, daily paper, a national paper in Sweden in the scientific section. So it was regarded to maybe be a Nobel Prize discovery. Our dear, PhD student, Ayla Butler. Some of you heard her yesterday. She was in the veterinarian, uh, veterinarian symposium and did an excellent presentation about uh, these, uh, the, the honey which is enriched with these 13 lactic acid bacteria. And we have done the first horses to start with. We hope to go into human uh, trials. This is Inke, a working horse. He's working all days long in the forest, but he has terrible, terrible wounds on his legs. You can see to the left, and 15 days later, even the hair has grown out. All the horses we have had in this trial, we have now 10 horses. All of them have healed within about two weeks, up to three weeks, from uh, ulcers they have had for 
years and years. Some horses even have to be slaughtered because of these very painful wounds. So we are very optimistic when we come into human trials. Maybe in the Madrid horse show you have some of these beautiful Andalusian horses which suffer from these kind of wounds and then we, have, we can help them. I think we can promise that, Ayla, can't we? We can send them a little bit of this. I'm optimistic that we are on, the, on our way to identify new potential topical antimicrobial agents for wound management because we have to. This is the situation with the Staph aureus uh, MRS or MRSA situation in parts of the world. So um, this is quite a serious uh, situation. We use much too much antibiotics in wound management and I'm looking, to, looking at David Lieber who has been the one who has been leading this uh, very hard work to reduce the antibiotics in the world. In uh, one clinic in Sweden, Agneta is here somewhere, 91% of the new admittance of leg ulcer patients in a wound clinic had antibiotics or had had that during the past six months. With modern topical antiseptics, this can be reduced to 20%. And I think some of you might have been in Ruth's, uh, Ruth Oyen's symposium this day where she could show some of these figures, which is very encouraging, I must say. Conclusions, innovation, know-how, history, history and technology. I think we should add history also. Future, nature guided by science. I think we might see that. Modern and future wound management might be influenced by ancient wisdom, by access to advanced scientific methods explaining wound healing and antimicrobial properties of nature's gifts to humans. Advanced technology will aid in the explanation of empirically practiced wound management, and we must gain more knowledge on a global basis of the actual situation regarding antibiotics in wound management. Years have gone, wrinkles have come, yet inside I feel as curious and as passionate as I was in 1965 when I was graduated as a new young nurse. I will continue the search for optimal wound management, letting nature backed up by science guide the pathway. The patients will be the constant source of inspiration. As well as my dear colleagues and friends in Yuma and Europe, a thousand thanks, queridos amigos, queridos amigos. <laughs> and let us meet in Stockholm at the EPUAP meeting for pressure answers with a fantastic program. I re I'm really, really happy for all the contributing lecturers here. Uh, you can go into to the EPUAP website or you can take in the EPUAP boot some brochures and register and so on. It will be a fabulous meeting. So thank you all. Thank you, Yuma. I've been working many years in Yuma and it has been very rewarding and I think uh, I owe Yuma very, very much thanks. And un million de gracias. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Christina, and I think what is, um, inspiration is inspirational is that you will carry on with your research. So can we just thank Christina once again? Thank you.